Uh, it's actually an initiative from uh, two NGOs which uh, works in Kerala. Uh, it's uh, uh, Kotem Nature Society and Alapi Naturalistic Society. Uh, we started this is uh, 50 days back. This is our 50th webinar. We've been doing this uh, every day, uh, past uh, you know, 49 days. So we covered quite a lot of different topics, uh, ranging from tigers to uh, turtles, butterflies, dragonflies, Hi. frogs, reptiles, things. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, today we are lucky to have a Romulus Whitaker. He don't need any introduction. He's like the snake man of India. He written an uh, uh, amazing book on snakes of India, which is still, it's like our Bible. And uh, I mean, the amount of work he done for the snake conservation and uh, he started Madras Crocodile Bank, Anet, now the Agumbe Research Station. I think, uh, thank you so much, uh, Rom, all this contribution for Indian herpetology. Uh, A big thanks to the Kotiam Nature Society and the Alapi Natural History Society and to you, David, for getting me on board here to spout about my obsession with King Cobras. This is a really wonderful opportunity. A lot of you are old friends. A lot of you are new friends. And uh, I think uh, this is a really fascinating opportunity for me to talk about King Cobras, which I have long sort of said that this is my favorite snake because people are always saying, what is your favorite snake, Ron? I guess I have to admit it's the King Cobra. Yeah. So I'm ready to go whenever everyone gets there. Well, good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to be here with you, even though we're not together, we are together in a way. Um, King Cobras have always been an obsession with me along with all the other snakes in the world. And uh, in this case, uh, I've been very lucky to have been brought up in India and actually spent my schooling days in the Western Ghats where King Cobras are found. And uh, the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station, which I set up in 2005, was really this sort of moment at which I became very serious about looking at king cobras and their behavior. Can you see the next one? And uh, that is when we got together. Next slide, please. Okay, I put this India state map in for some of our friends, international friends who may be slightly geographically uh, disoriented about India, but the next slide shows you the range of the king cobra in India. Next one, please. Okay, um, king cobras are found in the Western Ghats, of course, in the Eastern Ghats, in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, and then starting in Odisha, all the way up into the Northeast, and then across the Himalayas, virtually all the way to Himachal Pradesh. And uh, they, are, they do enter into Goa, and there is a chance that they have been recorded in the southern tip of Maharashtra as well. Okay, it's... Um, a snake which I would always, when I see the snake, to me it's an innocent snake. To other people it's a very deadly and the largest venomous snake. It has all this big sort of hype about how huge and how dangerous it is. Indeed, it has a large quantity of venom in its venom glands, but indeed also it's a very nervous snake as far as humans are concerned and it rightly keeps out of people's way. And it's just that it, and being a large snake, luckily it can be easily avoided. And luckily it is not, it is not nocturnal. It's mainly diurnal, it's around in the daytime. So you don't have instances of people stepping on them at night. So it causes very few bites. That's very fortunate for India because we don't have an anti venom for King Cobra bite. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Okay, the Danish naturalist Peter Cantor described the king cobra way back in 1836. It's not really so way back when you consider such a large and very obvious snake was only described rather recently compared to so many of the other species of snakes. And it was originally called, in, put in the same genus as the cobra, Naja or Naya, and has then been changed to Ophiophagus. And the name Ophiophagus means it's a snake eater. And indeed, it does feed primarily on snakes, although it does take monitor lizards as well. The second image, 
next image is uh, a drawing which was done by an artist in West Bengal way back in 1830s when uh, Dr. Cantor described the snake first. Next one, please. The next image shows you a picture of the mangrove swamps in the Sundarbans in West Bengal, where the king cobra was first found and first described. And it also, it, in a way, it's very interesting because it shows the different habitats that they're found in. And they're found in the Western Ghats, the deep rainforests, as well as in the mangrove swamps of the Sundarbans and the mangrove swamps in Odisha in the Tarkanika. Next one, please. Okay, in the Western Ghats, this is a very typical snake during the breeding season. This is a male king cobra. And the reason why I say typical during the breeding season is because they actually change color and become lighter in the breeding season, the mature adult male king cobras. Next one, please. This is a female king cobra in the breeding season, and she is much darker and uh, with very contrasting bands. And we think that this is very important for her to be able to identify herself to a male king cobra who might be a hungry fellow. And since they are cannibalistic, it's very important for the female king cobra to show that she's not a food item, but rather a, an item that can, who can be mated with. Next one, please. And the color and banding differ dramatically in different parts of India, which kind of indicates just visually that we're looking very likely at different species. But that's another whole discussion. We'll talk about that a bit later. But let's see the next one. This is a typical dark male Western Ghats king cobra in the non-breeding season. You saw the first one that I showed you was a very light color during the breeding season. This is in the non-breeding season. The Western Ghats King Cobra is very dark with yellowish and whitish bands. Next one. Next, please. Yeah. And here, very, very different is a King Cobra uh, the, the, it, from the lower Himalayas. This was in Corbett National Park. This is an adult male. Very, very different from the ones in the Western Ghats. And the next one you will see from the Andaman Islands is again quite different. The number of bands, the width of the bands, and the coloration, very different indeed. And it is very likely we are looking at different species of king cobras here. Next one. This one, again, different kinds of bands, different shape of bands, and different coloration. This is a typical king cobra from the mangroves of east coast of Odisha in actually the Bitar Kanaka area, the mangrove swamps. Next one. And again, one from the Sundarbans. And you saw the original painting, which was done back in Cantor's time, very, very similar to this one found on the mud flats in the Sundarbans. Next one, please. Okay, uh, there's a couple of shots these two or three shots of the forests in the Western Ghats. Many of you have visited the Western Ghats and know the forest indeed. But let me just show you the next one, please. It uh, indicates the diversity of flora. The vegetation there is incredibly diverse. It's a, a very wet landscape in most parts of the Western Ghats, which is ideal for king cobras and their prey. Next one, please. and plenty of water, plenty of streams. I think the remarkable thing about the streams in the forests are that even when the water is rushing at the beginning of the monsoon, they're not muddy streams. They're always clear and clear and beautiful uh, water during the, even during the heavy rains. Next. And this was taken just behind the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station in the stream that below it where we have a field station. You can see what a fantastic location this is. Next one, please. Okay, just to point out where the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station is, 
the uh, arrow points right to it. You can see how far it is away from Bangalore. It's very close to Mangalore, actually, on the west coast, just inland from Mangalore, where the Western Ghats begin. And the next one, please. And the various statistics, it has as much as seven to eight mil, um, meters of rain every year. The elevation of Agumbe is not very high, it's 680 meters, and the habitat is variable, evergreen forest primarily, but there are plenty of rice paddies and various areca nut and other tree plantations there. Next one. Okay, a view of part of the Agumbe rainforest area. Uh, to the left is an area called the Someshwara National Park, uh, wildlife sanctuary, pardon me. And this is also very close and almost adjacent to the Kudumuk National Park. I think there's a photograph of that coming up. Next one, please. Okay, it is naturally, I mean, the Western Ghats in general is a diversity hotspot. And many new species are being described, uh, discovered and described there as we speak mostly amphibians right now. Next. Um, this, uh, these figures are way out of date. For example, the amphibians have only put 180, but they're well over 250 now, having been described. And uh, mammals 135 plus, reptiles 225 plus, birds 500 plus, butterflies again many more species are being described and many more, particularly insects, have to be described. And at the bottom, uh, you can't see it probably very clearly, but leeches are a definite, uh, I wouldn't say problem, but an ever-present uh, <laughs> complication, you could say. Okay, some of the other reptiles in the King Cobra's realm in these Western Ghats are, and let's have a look at them. The Russell's viper, this is a very different color phase, a very different and very interesting color phase found in the uh, Mangalore area and inland from Mangalore, where you can hardly see any of the typical markings of the Russell's viper, and it's got this very reddish color. Interestingly, it lived, it, this particular snake was found very uh, amongst laterite rock, which is reddish itself. So there's definitely a correlation there. Next one. And this beautiful forest lizard, one of the most multicolored lizards that we have in India. Next one, please. The flying lizard, or Draco, uh, which is very common, particularly in Areca nut plantations, they love it. And uh, one of my favorite reptiles. The cane turtle, which was uh, rediscovered by a young lady herpetologist named Vijaya and it was renamed Vijaya Kelly's in her honor um, in recent years. Next one. Brooks forest lizard, a very common species of a gamut found again in, very easy to see in areca nut plantations. And here's a mating pair of Malabar pit vipers. You can see the male is absolutely minuscule compared to the female. And this is an interesting dimorphism, which is very common among many species of snakes, where the male is much smaller than the female. Next one is a, this is a large-scale shield tail. There are several species of shield tail snakes uh, in the Gumbi area and throughout the Western Ghats, and several more have recently been described. And I think important from the human standpoint are that these waters are the source for half a billion people. The rivers that emerge from the Western Ghats, uh, the mouth, uh, the uh, head of the Calvary River, for example, in the Western Ghats in Kug, uh, serve how many millions of people? So this is how important the Western Ghats are, even though we've lost nearly 80% of the forest there already. Next one. Yeah, seven to 8,000 millimeters of uh, rain a year there. Uh, it is really wet. It's very hard to dry your clothes out, let me tell you. And uh, one year we got 11,000 millimeters of rain. Uh, that rivals Chirapunji, I'm sure. Next one, please. Yeah, just a couple of scenic shots of the 
waterfalls and streams that are throughout the area. There. Next one. Very good habitats for pit vipers along the edges of these streams. And walking along the, I mean, the streams themselves create very easy access into the forest. Okay, we set up this uh, research base in 2005. My mother actually provided, when she died, she left us uh, a legacy of money, enough to buy uh, 10 acres of land within the forest there. And luckily we found an old farmhouse, which uh, an elderly couple was very eager to get out of there and said, please buy our land. And we were certainly very happy to take it over. And that's when, that's where the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station started. Next one, please. It's been uh, very successful. Uh, during the monsoon, you can see that the whole place becomes completely shadow, overshadowed with fog. And uh, there is no glimpse of sunlight sometimes for a month or two at a time. Next one. We've set up uh, several cottages for people to stay. I mean, working in the rainforest is exciting, but it is a little bit tiring too. And uh, unless you have a comfortable place, you can come back to in the evening and rest and have a good meal and a, a nice night's sleep. It's pretty difficult working, I can tell you. Next one. So various aspects of research have been done. We've uh, attracted researchers from all over India and all over the world, really, to come there and carry out different kinds of research and filming activities. Next one, please. And the biodiversity there is fantastic, as you can imagine. And we're doing stuff uh, up in the canopy as well. And uh, we're putting out camera traps and finding out some very, very interesting creatures. In fact, there's a black leopard who's using our area as his home range. And he appears on the camera trap quite often these days. Next one. There is uh, incredible diversity of amphibians in particular. More and more species are being described as we speak. Next one. Kudamuk Tiger Reserve is very close to Agombe. And uh, this is typical grasslands and shola forests of this kind of habitat, and uh, complete with tigers. Okay, we get uh, king cobra calls from farmers and villages almost every day. And I'm just going to go through a couple of shots uh, showing you that there is a safe and sane way to rescue king cobras. For example, just have a look at this. This one fell into a well, quite a deep well. It's a dry well. And to get him out was pretty difficult, but it was done very carefully. It was, let's say, a safe and gentle way of getting the king cobra out. Next. This was a very interesting king cobra who was shedding his skin, uh, shedding her skin. It was a female. And uh, she actually stayed in the bathroom for several days. And uh, the I asked the people, why didn't you call me earlier? And they said, well, it wasn't hurting us and we can always use some other bathroom. <laughs> so they were very patient in letting it stay there for that length of time. Next. And uh, in this case, the king cobra was seeking warmth and ended up in the, underneath the hood of a car. Luckily, they checked it before they were driving off that day because it could have been some serious repercussions. Next one. And in this case, again, very lucky, they did see the king cobra up under the dashboard of this truck. And uh, to get it out was quite a hassle, as you can imagine. Next one. And here's Ajay Giri finding a king cobra in the roof of a house and bagging it with everyone looking on. The reason king cobras come to people's houses is searching for snakes because there are very often rats in houses and very often cobras and rat snakes come to people's houses. And the king cobra with its incredible sense of smell using its tongue will search and find the snake that is going to be its next meal. So finding it up on the roof is a little complicated, of course. But king cobra rescue should be relaxed and cool. None of the crazy stuff that you see on some of the Facebook 
postings you see nowadays of people grabbing it by the neck. I gotta admit, Ajay is one of the most careful king cobra handlers, and I think we have a short video to show you at the end of this to give an idea of exactly how, he's, how he does it. Next one. And the release of the king cobra is incredibly important to release him close by within the king cobra's home range. This is not very easy sometimes because when you catch a king cobra near or in someone's house, they say, please take it far away. And you say, of course, of course. And usually the, the idea is that you, you explain to them, look, this is the first time you've seen this king cobra, but he's in, this is his home range and he's not hurting anybody. And chances are he's going to be eating up all the cobras and vipers around here anyway. So this is a good educational spiel that Ajay will give at the end of every capture. Next. But there's a stupid and dangerous way to rescue King Cobra too. Now just check this one out. Now this guy uh, is very lucky to be alive and uh, he is disrespectful to the snake. And the snake is, um, is fortunately very, let's say, condescending or very easygoing and is not trying to kill him. Next one. And this shows a rather famous fellow down in Kerala who does the same thing. And uh, I, I just have to say that uh, this is one of the most ridiculous types of performances one can do. And it just shows that the snake is not interested in biting. He only wants to get away. And more insanity. Yeah, you see a lot of this stuff on Facebook these days. And uh, try as we, we we're trying very hard to convince people that yes, snakes do have to be rescued, but do respect the snakes. And usually, when we ask snake rescuers, so do you like snakes? And they say yes, we like snakes. Okay, then respect them, treat them carefully. And here's a guy to, who grabs the king cobra by the neck. He's endangering himself, his own life. And he's definitely endangering the snake. He could easily injure the snake by grabbing it and holding it, squeezing it like this. Next one. And the same with this guy, grabbing it by the neck, making a hero pose for a photograph. This is very dangerous to the snake and very dangerous to the catcher. And there is absolutely no need to do this. So the Rescue and relocation is definitely sometimes necessary, but it can be done safely. And I think it's pretty clear how it can be done safely. Uh, and these are rescuers who were actually killed by King Cobras in a couple of years ago. Prufflebutt, not far away from Agumbe, uh, a couple of years ago, Kamal in, in Nepal, who was drunk when he had this King Cobra around his neck. And a friend of ours, uh, in Bali, whom we tried very hard to convince not to catch King Cobras by neck, grabbing him by the neck. He did, he got bitten, and there were no antivenom for any of these cases, and they all died. Totally useless waste of life. And going back, King Cobras are respected and revered, which is really wonderful. Uh, you can actually see a grin on the faces of these ladies who are looking at the King Cobra. And partly due to our um, educational efforts in Agumbe, people are very easy going about it. But elsewhere in India, these snakes face big problems. For example, in Andhra Pradesh, in the Eastern Ghats where king cobras are found, they're usually killed on site. Luckily, a friend of ours named Murti has started a project over there. He's with the Eastern Ghats Wildlife Society. And he has, uh, they have now have a small video showing how the people of Agumbe are, get along with King Cobras. And it's been dubbed in Telugu. And people in Andhra Pradesh are now calling up for the rescue of the King Cobra rather than killing it. Next one. Unfortunately, in the Northeast, things are a little bit different. These pictures were all taken in Mizoram in recent years. And people uh, have a tendency to kill King Cobras on site. So there's still a lot of work to do and a lot of education to go on to happen. Next one. And the main thing is education. It is really a priority. A rescue is a perfect time for education. And you can see that Ajay has just caught a king cobra. It's in a bag right in the center there. 
that people are all standing around listening to him, telling them exactly why the king cobra has come near a house, probably to find a snake, that they're not interested in hurting people, and that if they see a human being, they'll get the heck out of there fast. They're very respectful of humans, quite rightfully so. Yeah, so we've made various pamphlets, in this case in Canada, but uh, pamphlets in the various regional languages are extremely important to tell people the basic facts about King Cobras and along, goes really well along with the educational work that uh, is being done by people like uh, Ajahn. Next one. And these education programs have told us, have uh, gotten a lot of information for us. For example, the lady who's right in, in front of me, uh, standing there, actually found this pile of leaves and decided she'd collect it to put in her cow shed. And when she put her arms around the leaves, she heard this loud sound from the inside and she got scared and called us up. And sure enough, there was a female king cobra and it was a king cobra there. So it works. Next one. Okay, the king cobra is the only snake out of 3,000 odd species in the world that actually makes a nest. This is really amazing. She piles up this massive pile of leaves. It takes her a week or two, or maybe even three weeks, to make this incubation chamber for her eggs, to keep the eggs dry from torrential rains and perfect temperature for incubation. Next one. Uh, the snake actually has to cover the eggs with the leaves and uh, then she'll sit on the nest Next one. and if any other if a predator comes nearby she'll protect them so covering the eggs they have to incubate there for a couple of months and uh, in the western gods uh, the king cobra usually makes the nest and then within a week or two, she actually leaves, she deserts the nest. A very, very different behavior in other parts like in the Northeast India. The next one, please. In, in Northeast India and in the Andaman Islands and in Thailand, the king cobra female stays on her nest for the entire incubation all the way to the end till the babies hatch. And this is obviously a good deterrent for predators because any predator who comes and sees a big snake like this lying on the top of a pile of leaves is not going to mess around, not going to mess with it, I should say. Next one. Yeah, next one, please. In uh, Agombe, we have uh, been able to. Uh, get some, this uh, Kirti is a zoology student and right near her house, not even 50 yards away from her house, a king cobra made a nest. Her parents weren't too happy about the whole idea, but we asked her if she would check the temperatures of the nest over the period, during the period of incubation. And we promised her parents that we would take the babies and release them away from the house. So they were quite okay with her doing this. And this was exciting for her too. Yeah, the eggs are leathery, they're longish, and uh, the incubation temperature is anywhere from 22 degrees to 32 degrees, 32 degrees centigrade, depending on, of course, the outside temperature. And the nest does incubate them, uh, help to, the, the, the pile of leaves helps to incubate them. The babies hatch anywhere from 70 days in a higher temperature nest to all the way to over 100 days. We had a nest in Kudermuk, which was at a higher altitude, nearly 1,700 meters. And uh, there the nest it was quite cool. So it took 113 days for the babies to find the hatch. But it was 100% hatching. All of them hatched. And when the babies hatch, if it's uh, near somebody's house, we usually put a plastic sheet around the nest so the babies don't escape. People are not too happy about the idea of 20 or 30 babies or king cobras around their house. So we take them a bit of a distance away into the forest and release them. 
naturally the mortality is very high in baby snakes, just like in any baby reptile. So very few of them survive. A lot of predators, even with attitude like this. Uh, a mongoose, an uh, eagle, an owl, uh, uh, even uh, wild cats, civet cats, and wild boar, and monitor lizards. They've got many enemies. Other snakes, of course, too. Next one. All right, male combat is a, a very interesting part of snake uh, behavior, which uh, many species take part in doing this. And uh, this is a, a, a dominance thing. Uh, it's usually related to mating. Usually, uh, we found that if we, if we have made the observations, there'll be a female fairly close by where this combat is going on. The combat is not a serious sort of uh, life-threatening type of combat. It's really a wrestling match, and people are often referred to it as a combat dance and uh, or a ritual combat. And it's basically can go on for uh, even an hour, sometimes even two hours, and they really get exhausted. But one does seem to come out the winner, and he's probably the one who's going to be mating with the female who may be nearby. The interesting thing is that uh, since we're doing radio telemetry at uh, Agombe, which we'll talk about in a minute, we get to follow the male king cobras during the breeding season, which is just on and just ending now, actually. And uh, we get to see male combat quite frequently. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about telemetry. Radio telemetry is an incredible uh, opportunity to, to actually look into the secret life of snakes because you catch a king cobra, you release it, and then what happens? We have no idea. It just disappears and we don't see it again. So in 2008, we started king cobra telemetry. And the first thing you got to do, of course, is bag your king cobra. That's Jerry Martin, one of our friends and colleagues, an expert snake handler, and he's just bagging the king cobra. Next one. Getting it into the bag is incredibly important, obviously. It has to be done very carefully. And using an airtight container to anesthetize it, using an, uh, a, a, a gas which can anesthetize the snake, put it to sleep safely. And right here uh, in the in the background is Anirudh Balsare, a, a veterinarian. And in the center is Matt Good, he's a telemetry expert. And uh, the state, New uh, Mexico State herpetologist, Charlie Painter in the foreground. This was the first king cobra, a three meter long male that we put a radio into. So the snake goes under, he's now anesthetized, and the first implant, the implant begins. And Matt is taking the, doing the surgery in this case. The radio is about the size of your thumb, and it uh, weighs about 25 grams. And uh, it has a range of anywhere from 500 meters to, uh, to almost a kilometer in some cases. And it will have a life of about two years. So the battery life is about two years, so you can actually follow the snake. This is in inserted in the salomic cavity. It's in the, inside the body cavity and uh, it has a long antenna inside, which will beep the signal out. Next one. Uh, along with the uh, transmitter, we also in insert eye buttons to log the temperature. And this is a very important part of learning about the King Cobra's behavior, finding out what temperatures they, uh, what, they, what they're what they doing, what their behavior is like at what temperatures. This is an, a close-up image of uh, showing you the tiny eye button, which also goes into the snake. Okay, the snake is now under, but uh, you have to actually intubate uh, by giving it so-called kiss of life. Next one. And in this case, Matt is giving it. You actually insert a straw into the glottis of the snake, hold it very carefully because you don't know how fast he might recover and blow fresh air inside and then uh, squeeze 
the gas out of his lungs so that he becomes normal and back to back into a healthy alert condition. Again. Okay, and then getting the people out there to track the snake is the difficult part of it. We've worked out a system which works very well. We have volunteers who are come there, usually they are biology students and other students who are, are interested in doing this as a, a very, very unique opportunity to study snakes. And the local tracker sitting there is the guy who is the key man because he knows the forest and knows how his way through the forest because the snake could go in any direction and he has to be found, you have to keep with him. So it's very important to have a local tracker. Next one. All right, uh, wonderful thing about Google Maps is that you can uh, locate uh, the snake wherever he's gone and uh, track it completely through the landscape. And you can see here the diversity of the landscape. There's forest all on the left here, but on the right, it's, it's a very, very diverse human dominated landscape. Next one, please. Now, in this case, M1 was an experiment. He was actually translocated 40 kilometers. I told you earlier that it's very important not to translocate a, 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 a snake. In fact, any animal, when it's being relocated, it should be re relocated as close to its home range as possible. But we had a very important uh, thing to prove here that translocating a king cobra is not a good thing for it. And uh, David, if I can request you to the short video clip on. Yes, now just check this out very carefully, please. And you'll see the movement of this snake. I'm not sure if it's clear enough for you to see it, but uh, the data is on the right hand side. Now, M1 moved in all sorts of crazy directions because he couldn't find his way home, basically. And he moved almost, well, close to 100 kilometers. But you can imagine a snake moving 100 kilometers. This is in itself quite an incredible thing. M2, on the other hand, was caught, and ever since then we've uh, caught and released him in the same place. So this is M2. And you'll notice that he doesn't go off in some terrible direction. He usually stays in one very, very compact circular direction. Even though he travels many, many kilometers over a period of a year, his home range is very, very small. And he knows exactly where he's going. In this case, it's, uh, I, I believe, only 15 square kilometers, which is pretty big for a snake. But uh, in fact, it's a very, very circular pattern. And the snakes seem to know exactly what they're doing, where they're going, where they can find food, where they can find water, where they can hide. And you notice that he's been crossing the road quite a bit there too, which is a bit scary for us because every time he crosses the road, we're saying, oh my God, I hope he doesn't get run over. So this is his entire home range. He didn't go off in some terrible direction the way in one day. This is the home range of a king cobra. And this was a real eye opener for us. Okay. And M2's home range is very clearly shown on this map, very circular pattern, and this is the place he knows best. Next one. Okay, he was uh, in the monsoon months, he was in the forest, and in the summer he came out to the fields. In the fields he was finding common cobras and rat snakes, and in the forest in the monsoon he was finding pit vipers. M4 was a, another uh, king cobra who had a larger home range of 30 square kilometers. And look at the landscape that he went through. It was hardly any forest actually that he lived in. He lived mostly in people's rice fields and in people's farms and backyards. So plenty of rat snakes, obviously, and plenty of cobras too. So he was he was doing okay as long as he was as long as the people were okay with him. He was doing fine. Next one. So they, King Corvus seem to have an olfactory and or a visual map of their home range. And the, the proof of the pudding here is that translocation is not good for King Cobras. That M1 just didn't know where the hell to go. 
and where to find a place to rest. Okay, we have published quite a bit of these findings. And in 1996, uh, Indranil Das and I did a bibliography, but it needs a lot of updating. The next slide shows you a few of the publications that we've come out with uh, in recent years, and more are, are coming out as we speak because we're now tracking three king cobras in Agumbe. So this has been an incredible exercise. We never really knew very much about king cobras until now. And uh, a similar project and a similar study is going on in Thailand, in Northern Thailand, and a lot of very interesting and wonderful data is coming up from there as well. Next one. Okay, a lot of secrets are emerging, as I said. Some are not so pretty. I mean, courtship, in, in, for one thing, was usually gentle and very persistent. The male would butt the female, coming closer to her, coming over her. The female putting on this display. Next one, please. Uh, the female basically trying to make sure that the male knows that she's not a food item, that she's, uh, she's for mating, not for, for eating and uh, she will make this submissive display. But things can go terribly wrong. And in this case, uh, a female, the male actually bit and killed uh, a female who had already, was already gravid. She already had eggs. And you can actually see the swelling of her body where the eggs are. And we found this uh, since then, this was back in 2010 or 2011, we found, uh, we've observed this three or four times now that uh, males have killed females. We're not really quite sure how this works. This is not evolutionarily very wise, but we do know that cannibalism is very common in many snake species. Here's a common spectacle cobra grabbing another spectacle cobra to kill it and eat it. And we'll see several more. So here's a vine snake swallowing a, a, fly, a flying snake, again, in a gumbe. And the next one. Here's a banded crate swallowing a Russell's viper up in Northeast India. Next one. And a cobra swallowing a Russell's viper. So snakes eating snakes is pretty common. It's not unusual at all. And here's a coral snake eating a Europeltid, one of the shield-tailed snakes. Next one. Cobras are definitely on the king cobra's menu. And despite the cobra spreading his hood and putting on a good show, he hasn't got a chance. Next one, please. Once a king cobra has started following the scent or the track of another snake, that snake has had it. This snake, this cobra is, again, trying to put on a show, trying to be brave, but he hasn't got a chance. Next one. And here's a case of a king cobra which actually grabs the a spectacle cobra in the water, grabs it by the head and kills it. The Asian rat snake, the common rat snake, is actually uh, probably, next slide, shows you a, a rat snake being swallowed by a king cobra, and they probably form a major part of the king cobra's diet, especially the king cobras who spend their time in and around rice fields and people's mouth. Because as you know, rat snakes are one of the most common snakes and common large snakes in India. And the king cobra wants a good big meal, not just a tiny meal. And we've seen um, rat snakes retaliate, including giving the king cobra a bad bite, and it looks like it's bad on its eyes. But uh, in this case, it, it didn't harm the snake at all. They've got a good covering over the eye, so the teeth didn't penetrate. And here is a king cobra eating my namesake, a Whitaker's boa. But this is just a snack. This is like a vade or a midli or something for a king cobra. It's not really a, a solid meal the way a rat snake. Interestingly, uh, the only other creature a king cobra will normally eat is a monitor lizard. And this kind of tells you how closely related monitors are to snakes with their forked tongues, with their Jacobson's organs. They obviously have the right smell, even if they don't have the right shape of the snake. They've got legs, which is a little bit difficult to get down, I'm sure. But uh, as far as the king cobra is concerned, it's a snake with legs. In this case, a friend of ours took a picture of a king cobra which was killed after swallowing a, a water monitor lizard. Next one. But kings will eat rats. 
you got to fool them. This, this, I'm just hamming this up with a, a sort of a chef's uh, outfit. We were doing it for a little film, which we never even used in the film. But we found a roadkill dead snake, and we made a soup out of it, and dipped the rats into a soup, and held it out to the king cobra. And the king cobra looked at it very dubiously. That doesn't look like a snake, but it sure smells like a snake. You could almost see its mind working. And it grabbed it out of my, I had it on the, on the tongs, and I grabbed it from the tongs and swallowed it. So we started feeding it rats, which is very useful for having king, captive king cobras. Otherwise, you have to keep catching snakes to feed them all the time. Rats are much easier to get. Yeah. Next one. Okay, that brings us to an end. And uh, there was just um, a, a few pictures of king cobras after this. And we'll see the last slide. Just to give you an idea of some of the portraits of king cobras, all very in, from very different parts of the country and therefore very different coloration and pattern. Um, I really thanks, thanks to you all very much for listening to me go on about King Cobras. I, I could go on for another couple of hours, I guess you can understand. But I do welcome you to try to come and visit Agombe when things get a little bit more normalized in this strange world of ours right now. The Agombe Rainforest Research Station has accommodation for people to come and stay. And it's very rare that you get to see a King Cobra in the wild, but if you come there, the chances are almost 100%. Now, besides Agumbe, we've uh, made several films. Uh, my wife, Janaki Lennon, and I made a film on King Cobras way back <clears throat> in 1996 for National Geographic. And uh, since then, uh, I've been involved in the making of three more King Cobra films. And so there are quite a few, uh, let's say, opportunities of bringing King Cobras into your living room via television. But if you want to see one in the wild, Come and visit us. Be in touch with us. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Rome. Uh, it was fantastic. Good to hear all the snakes. And in fact, I went to Agumba. I didn't get to see it for three days. What? That's a sad story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> I know. I never seen that snake in 15 years roaming around in Western Ghat. Okay. Next time, guarantee. Okay. Yeah, so anyway, we just drop it in the chat box. If you have any questions, probably we can take it off your questions. Uh, there's somebody is asking, can veterinary students do internship, uh, how to contact and all? Yeah, uh, why don't you contact me at kingcobra gmail.com and I can answer your question either directly or put you on to the right person. That's kingcobra at gmail.com. That's my email. Yeah. Very, very simple. Okay, there's a, there's a question from uh, Daniel Anthony. I would like to ask if any research being conducted into determining if king cobras in Southeast Asia, especially Thailand, are separate subspecies. Is there any studies? That's a very interesting question. And uh, our colleague Gauri Shankar, whom some of, some of you know or some of you heard about, is doing his PhD on precisely that. He has collected data and uh, from all over India and all over actually the range of king cobras, including Thailand. And they, they range all the way to the Philippines. I'm very sure that we've got at least four or five different species of king cobras. We're not talking about subspecies. We're talking about actual species. One in the Andaman seems very different from the one here. The ones in Northern India seem very different from the one here. The one even in the Eastern Ghats compared to the Western Ghats seems quite different as well. I'm not a taxonomist, so I can't answer that question, but there are people working on it and we should hear about it pretty soon. There's a question from Yogesh. Uh, sir, why no antivenom as yet for king cobras? Is there well, any antivenom? Well, in India, uh, there are hardly any bites recorded from king cobra. And you're right in asking that question. If, you, if, you, if by awful chance someone is bitten and they get to the hospital and they say, sorry, there's no antivenom. It, it's a pretty bad thing. But uh, it is made in Thailand, and we always stock King Cobra antivenom at our research station. And Murthy over in, uh, in Andhra Pradesh also stocks it. So wherever 
King Cobra research is going on, there is a stock of antivenom for King Cobra, but it's not made in India because there are hardly any bites which ever happen, which is a very interesting and very useful thing to know. One from Sweta, uh, what all what all precautions we should take while going for a field work to get protected from these snakes? Um, keep your eyes open. Uh, there's no reason to be frightened of the snakes. The snake is more frightened of you than you are of the snake. And the chances are very, very good that you will never see him. He might see you and get the heck out of there because humans are much more dangerous than snakes. Okay, there's an interesting question uh, from Surya Sartaj. Thank you so much for the informative session. What are the basics of rescuing a king cobra? What all things we need to take care of it? Okay, can I uh, ask you, David, at this point to show that short video clip of uh, Okay, one second. Ajay? Okay, let me explain first before you yeah. show it. Uh, you'll see stuff on YouTube of people grabbing them by the neck or doing all sorts of crazy things with king cobras in order to so-called rescue them. They're not rescuing them at all. They're half killing them in most cases and, and, very, and risking their lives, actually. The fact is that it's very easy to get a snake to go into a bag. And this is why I'm showing you this short video clip, uh, which shows Ajay Giri's methodology of bagging a king cobra. So let's just see that. And then if you have any question after that, we'll talk about it. So have a look at this short video. One. One second, I'm just opening that. Sure. Okay, there's no sound on this, uh, on this video. This is a rescue of a king cobra, which was in somebody's house. And uh, Ajay, was, Ajay Giri is the director, field director of the Agumbe Rainforest Research Station. And he gets these calls literally every day. In this case, he's pulled it out of someone's storeroom, out into the open, and you'll see what he's got set up. He's got a bag stretched out and a pipe, a piece of pipe is connected to the front of the bag. Now, the main thing that he has to do is with his snake hook, very carefully point it in the direction of the bag. When the king cobra sees that opening of the pipe, he very quickly goes inside because that's safety as far as he's concerned. And then Ajay very carefully twists the bag, ties it up, make sure that he doesn't put his hands onto the bag because the snake can bite through the bag and twists it, ties it in a knot, and the snake is back very safely. This is done without any hoo-ha, without any excitement, jumping around, yelling, or anything like that, which is what you often see on these various snake um, rescues that you see. And uh, I, this guy is one of the calmest, coolest snake catchers that I know of. And uh, this is the way to do it, basically. It is risky. Handling any venomous snake is risky. And after he finishes the rescue, he always takes time to give a lecture to the people because they want to ask all the questions, which I'm sure is in your mind. And when he takes it out for releasing the snake, he releases it again, close enough that the snake can find its own home range, not far away. The people always say, please take it five kilometers away. But we'll say, look, we have to take it within about a half kilometer. Okay, if there's any questions uh, on that, please let me know. Yeah, there's more questions uh, coming up. Thanks. Sure. Uh, uh, from Yash, uh, hello, Rom. Uh, can you recall any infectious uh, diseases in King Cobra seen by you or any recorded available? Yeah. Um, not so much diseases, but they, uh, they do get different kinds of parasites, both skin parasites as well as internal parasites. And once we had our king cobra, which uh, was very emaciated, uh, which Ajay, I think, uh, had captured, and we released it quite close to where we are so that we could keep an eye on it. 
we watched it for a couple of weeks and it actually died. It, it just was so emaciated and so thin. We're wondering maybe it died of old age, but we we're able to get permission to do a necropsy to open it up and check it inside. And it had a full load of gut parasites. I, I'm sorry, I can't give you the identification of these parasites, but they were worms. And so they were either the cause of death or the fact that the snake was so weak, the, the parasites attacked it. So, but there's very little work uh, done on, uh, on diseases in wild snakes in general, and king cobras in particular. We know very little about it. Very interesting subject. Okay. There's a interesting question from media. Can you hear me? Yeah. Why don't any actions come up with come up against rescuers not taking into consideration of proper welfare of snake? I mean, yeah, I, I'm asking the same question every day. Uh, <laughs> we, we usually try to get to the uh, forest department uh, the concern. Yeah, and, and and they should be making the laws and the rules. Snake rescue is a, a you know a, a very difficult thing for the forest department to deal with because it's something that happens uh, out of necessity. A, a snake comes in someone's house and they get scared of it and they'll either kill it or or the best thing that they can think of is to try to get someone to rescue it and take it outside. But unfortunately, some of these rescuers are just crazy. And uh, I, I understand that more than 20 young fellows, almost all males, have been killed in Maharashtra over the last two or three years. And these are all snake rescuers who did something stupid, like, you know, try to kiss the cobra or show a, some hero photo on Facebook. This is ridiculous, totally ridiculous. The forest department really needs to tighten down on this. Okay. Uh, hello? Yep. I'm here. Uh, is there any other uh, uh, translocation for... Uh, okay, from, uh, from Dilip KG. Thanks for the informative session. You said translocation is not good for king cobras. What about spectacle cobra, russell swipers, and others? No, it's not good for any snake. Unfortunately, then what, uh, I mean, people you usually ask, uh, well, what if we catch it in a city? What, what if it's within a city? How can you just let it go outside in a city again? And to answer that question is very difficult. Obviously, you try to, in, in a wild situation or in a, uh, let's say, in a farm, the snake, that's the snake's natural habitat. So just taking it a few hundred meters away from where you caught it is fine. Just release it there. In a city, it's a totally different ball game. I, you have to take the chance of releasing it in the wild. Uh, one from Kishore. Do juvenile king cobras eat lizards, rats, and frogs, or do they also feed on only snakes? That's a really good question, and I'd love to know the answer to that because uh, you got to realize when a baby snake, a baby king cobra hatches, it's got to find some baby snakes to eat. So luckily at that time of the year when they hatch, it's toward the end of the rainy season. And that is a good time for it to find other baby snakes. I've got a feeling they might eat skinks, uh, smaller lizards, but we haven't proven that for sure. That's a very good question. Uh, one from Malay Pandey. Uh, what restricts the distribution of king cobras? Is it environmental factors or could be human conflict restrict uh, distribution? Probably a bit of both, but it's mostly environmental factors. Uh, king cobras want uh, areas which are higher in rainfall, uh, although the, some of the places that they're found in the Eastern Ghats, for example, don't have a very high rainfall but it has a good green habitat, evergreen habitat. So they have, there are these uh, dry evergreen forests which are in the Eastern Ghats where king cobras are found. So it's primarily habitat that they require. Okay, how do king uh, cobras mark their territory? That's an interesting one. Yeah, it is an interesting one. Uh, all snakes have uh, scent glands in the cloaca and uh, some snakes have scent glands uh, on the tops of their uh, next. And in the case of the king cobra, it does have scent glands in the uh, cloaca, and chances are it does mark its territory, but very little is known about this. We do know that when a king cobra wants to find 
uh, its prey, for example, it will see, it'll go after, we've actually watched the king cobra following uh, a, a pit viper which swam across the stream and you'd think, well, the stream would wipe out the smell, but the king cobra kept flicking its tongue as it went up along the stream and found the pit viper on the other side. We also observed uh, male king cobras finding where the female king cobra has gone, even though it's traveled more than a kilometer. So they're obviously leaving a scent trail behind, but very little is known about this. These are some of the secrets we're trying to unravel right now. Okay, there's a question from Wahiba. Uh, is there any program coming up in Agumbe? I wish uh, to join to learn more about it. Yeah, please be in touch with us and we can let you know the details, okay? Okay. Uh, do, you, do you mind taking a few more questions or? Not at all, go ahead. One second. Uh, do they have antibodies for their own venom in their blood? That's a really good question and we're pretty sure they do. And uh, this is true of many species of snakes. Uh, in fact, they seem to have antibodies even for other species of snakes, because we've seen king cobras getting bitten by spectacle cobras. We've seen them very regularly getting bitten by pit vipers, and it doesn't seem to affect them at all. But this has not been proved yet, and no experiment, real experiment has been done. I'm just talking about our uh, casual observations. Uh, do they give a dry bite? Uh, it has happened. I, I know about, uh, uh, in Thailand, I know about a king cobra handler who was bitten and uh, they thought he was going to die. They took him to hospital. They got the antivenom ready and there was no symptom at all, even though he got a very hard, a very good bite. A snake uh, injection of venom is totally voluntary. He can give venom. He can give a little venom, a lot of venom or no venom, depending on what he wants to do under those circumstances. So yes, dry bites are very possible. Quite a lot, lots of people are saying thank you so much. Okay, do kings found in Andamans undergo island gigantism when compared to Indian mainland kings? That's a good question. And actually I was under the impression that the Andamans king cobras were smaller than the mainland king cobras when I first started working uh, there in the I heard the same. mid 70s. But re in recent, the, the, as a young guy named uh, uh, Aaron Fernandez who's working there right now, and he's been doing quite a few king cobra rescues and he's got several of them which are quite large. I mean, maybe not as large as the ones in the Western Ghats, but there doesn't seem to be either any miniaturization or gigantism in the, in the Andamans. It's just a very different looking snake though, to me. Uh, one from uh, Sandeep K. Das, uh, do king cobras show arboreal behavior? Oh, most definitely. They're, they climb a lot. And even the big ones, even a three or four meter king cobra will climb trees. And we've seen them climbing up in trees and catching rat snakes and searching for pit vipers in trees and catching them up in the tree and eating them up there. So they're very arboreal. Yeah. Uh, one from Sangamesh. Uh, what could be the reason behind king cobra leaving its nest before the eggs hatches? Yeah, that's an excellent question too, because you, you would think, okay, you've gone through all this trouble making a nest and you're sitting there protecting it and keeping it safe from predators. So why should you go away? Why don't you stay there until the eggs hatch and the babies are okay? But in the case of the Western Ghats, invariably, the king cobra leaves the nest within a week or two. And we originally, when we first started seeing these nests, just a few of them in our early experiences 15 years ago, we thought that perhaps because they were being disturbed either by us coming and observing it or, or because they were close to human habitation. But it seems to be the rule for almost all, I mean, every case of Western Ghats nests we've seen, the female leaves quite soon. Whereas in the Andamans and in uh, Thailand and in Mizoram, those three locations where we know, I either personally have seen nests or we know people who have found nests, say that the female stays almost the entire incubation, 60, 70, 75 days until the babies hatch. 
Very interesting. Okay. Uh, those who want to volunteer, I mean, Sheshadri had just replied in the uh, uh, chat box. Uh, they can contact operation at the rate agumbe uh, rainforest.org. So Excellent. Thanks, Thank you, Sesh. <laughs> uh, do they produce any chemical to mark the territory? Um, yeah, we talked about that earlier. They do have musk glands in the cloaca, uh, right at the rear end, and they do. Uh, we're not really sure if they mark the territory. That's a very important question, which we're not really sure of. But they definitely have scent glands, and they definitely use that thing to search for other snakes, for other king cobras, either for mates, or maybe to find other males so they can chase them away, and certainly to find their prey. So they got an excellent sense of smell. Their tongue is a organ of taste, feel, and smell. You probably know that, the forked tongue. And they pick up particles on the ground or in the air on their tongue, and it goes back into their mouth, up into the top of their mouth called uh, the Jacobson's organ. And there, that's how, and they interpret what they're smelling or feeling or tasting. There's a question <laughs> from uh, uh, Harsiddhi. Uh, what makes it so dangerous for a king when one holds it from neck? Uh, the body of a snake, holding any snake by the neck is bad for the snake because the whole weight of the snake's body is on the neck. And especially if it thrashes around, you're talking about something you may not see happening, but what's going on inside you don't know. I mean, you might be separating the vertebrae inside the neck. You might be strangling the snake without even knowing it. So it's very dangerous for the snake. When we extract venom from the snakes, we have to be extremely careful to support the whole weight of the snake very carefully. And we only hold the snake by the neck for something very important, like getting a venom sample. Otherwise, we do not hold snakes by the neck. Okay. Uh, what's the lifespan of a king cobra? Uh, we know that one snake that we had lived for 32 years. Uh, we got it from Sundaran in Ahmedabad, and we kept it, at, they knew exactly how old it was there. And we kept it in the Madras Crocodile Bank for about six or seven years. And it uh, turned out to be 32 years old. And before it died, it's, it got blind in both eyes and it started shaking around. It really looked like an old man. It was uh, very shaky looking. So 32 years is probably the maximum that we know of. Wow. Okay, there's a question from uh, uh, Sivashankari. Is it possible to identify male and female snake from the field in King Cobra? Yeah, but it takes practice. The female has a much shorter tail than the male. The male has a long tail, which is because the hemipenis, the, the paired penis is in the tail of the male. And it's easy for us because we, we've seen a lot of them, but it's more difficult for someone who's new at it. And also the female seems to have quite a thinner head than the male. So I wouldn't say it's 100% possible to tell the male from the female. But if you see a, a king cobra over three meters long, you can be almost 100% sure it's a male because the females rarely grow beyond 2.5 or 2.6 meters. Okay. Uh, do environment have a role in sex determination of snakes? No, as far as we know, it hasn't been proven. In turtles, as you probably know, uh, Temperature sex determination in crocodilians and turtles is very well known and very well established. It's being studied in some lizards and in snakes, but it's not very clearly established and certainly not in King Kobe. So that's a good question. It's, it's uh, something that people are working on. Okay, uh, Rom, I have a question. I mean, I just, it's nothing to do with the snakes, but can we just uh, throw a few words about uh, Vijaya, who worked on uh, turtles. I mean, we heard she was an amazing field biologist. And she was. She was. I mean, any, do you want to say something about? Yeah, Vijaya uh, showed up at the Madras what? Snake Park when she was about, I think, 18 or 17 or 18 years old. And she came as a volunteer to the Madras Snake Park in around 1975, I'm tempted to say. And uh, then uh, she became very interested in turtles. And she started saying that she would like to go to the Western Ghats. And, and so she went down to Kerala and uh, 
as she was studying turtles there, she, I mean, as she was walking through the forest, she came upon this tame turtle and couldn't identify it at the beginning. And when she finally did identify it, she realized that she had rediscovered the tame turtle, which had been missing for, I, I can't remember, I think it's about 80 or 100 years since it was first described. It hadn't been seen. So she made an amazing discovery and uh, started keeping them, uh, feeding them and keeping them in semi-captivity and, uh, and made the first observations on their feeding behavior and everything. It was fascinating stuff. And she went on from that. I mean, that was <laughs> quite a, an opportunity in itself. I mean, quite an achievement in itself. But beyond that, she started going up and looking at the sea turtle harvest up in Diga Beach in West Bengal and um, took photographs, which ended up being published in India today. And when uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi saw these photographs, she was totally shocked and actually uh, got the slaughter of sea turtles stopped. So Vijaya, we owe a lot to her, actually. Unfortunately, Vijaya died at a very young age. I think she was less than 30 years old when she died. But uh, she has, many people say that she was India's first lady herpetologist. I'm not really sure if that's true. I'm sure we must have had some. It, OK, it is true. I'm just, I just heard from. From above. Can you hear me? You still there? David? Yeah, I, can you hear me now? Yeah, I got you. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of questions are piling up, so probably we'll stop taking the questions. I mean, those who want to uh, uh, ask any more questions, probably you can write to Rome. I think kingcobra at the red gmail.com, isn't it? That's it. Okay, uh, we'll probably take uh, one question from Facebook Live uh, from uh, Subhadi Chakrabarti. Heard somewhere that female king cobra have the capacity to store the sperms of male without getting fertilized. Is it true fact? How do they success doing it? Well, it's true in some species. And uh, very interestingly, my son did a, uh, made a paper which he called Immaculate Conception in the in the uh, soft shell, Ganges soft shell turtle, in which he had a male and a female, uh, and he had a, pardon me, a female soft shell turtle, Gan a huge Ganges soft shell turtle at the croc bank. And he had it for nine years, and every year it laid eggs, fertile eggs, but there were no male there at all. So it, it had obviously been storing sperm for nine years. So it happens in some species, but it hasn't been seen in snakes, I think. Certainly not in King Cobus yet. It's an interesting thing, though. really interesting. OK, thank you so much, Rom. Uh, do you want to add one or a few lines about the, the new generation who's coming to going to study king cobras or other snakes? How do yeah. you go about it? Well, any suggestions? Uh, I'm just very happy to see that there's this much interest in it. I mean, uh, I when I was sort of first doing all this way back in the 60s, <laughs> there were very few young people interested in snakes, and if they were, they were scared to death of them. And nowadays you have people passionately interested in snakes, so I'm offering all my encouragement to them. Now we've got good resources online to be able to find out a lot about snakes. We've got a pretty good snake book, which we're hoping to do a new version of pretty soon. So uh, I, I just offer all my encouragement, and uh, the more enthusiasm I hear from people, the more encouraged I get about it. So. Thanks very much for all this. Thank you so much, uh, Rom. It was a fantastic session. Good to see. I hope I'll also get to see this snake soon. Uh, <laughs> Guaranteed, <laughs> as I said. Okay. Thanks, David. Yeah. <laughs> really appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much, all of you who attended. On behalf of uh, Kotem Nature Society and Alapi Natural History Society, and all of those who attended, uh, we extend our thanks. And stay safe, uh, stay healthy, all of you. Yes. Good night. Good night. <laughs>